Um, hi everybody. Good morning. It's been far too long. I apologize for that. Um, we were having some technical difficulties the last stream that we had set up, which has been rescheduled for November. So I hope you guys will join us. Can you speak for a second, Kathleen? I want to make sure the sound works. I'm going to turn off my other computer. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yay. Yes, it's working. Oh my gosh. Okay. No technical issues. Woo. Okay. Um, so we've rescheduled that stream about advocacy for this upcoming month of November for Neem, as you all know. Um, but today we have a really special guest. Um, I've been really looking forward to this one because I really wanted to learn more about it myself. And as I've said on previous streams, this has also been a huge learning experience for me to learn about all the different programs and services we have going on. And so I'd love to introduce you guys and thank you for joining. I see we have a couple of viewers. Um, Kathleen from the Epilepsy Foundation. Um, Kathleen, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yes, thanks for having me today. I'm really excited to be on. I'm Dr. Kathleen Farrell. I'm the Senior Director of the Epilepsy Learning Healthcare System at the Epilepsy Foundation. Awesome. Yes, it's a mouthful. It's very important. That's what those are the cliff notes of what you need to know. <laughs> um, Kathleen is such an important piece of what your dollars and what you do to raise awareness about epilepsy in our community, whether you do charity streams, whether you help promote different activities, programs and services, whether you participate in what we're doing at the Epilepsy Foundation. Um, you really are helping to promote a lot of the work that Kathleen does and also helping us to raise awareness and reach more people in our community as a result. So I'm really excited for our conversation today because we're going to be talking about Ellis. Um, it's pronounced Ellis, like Ellis Gray, if you watch Gray's Anatomy. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's E-L-H-S, which what is what Kathleen mentioned when she was talking about what she does, the Epilepsy Learning Health Healthcare system. Healthcare so system. Yes. E L H S, or like you said, Ellis. We, you know, it's our it's our pet name for that network. It rolls off the tongue a little bit easier. It's nice. And yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, it makes it a lot simple. So, mm -hmm. um, what is a learning network um, and what is quality improvement? So those are kind of key components of Ellis, right? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm really glad we get to talk through this and we can go um, through each piece. The concept of a learning network or a learning health system uh, has been around for over a decade. The Institute of Medicine outlined those concepts back in 2007. And then the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality further described the key elements of what that really is. And there's you know, a few pieces to that. Um, first is that you need a committed leader group um, that are committed to a culture of continuous learning and improvement. You need to be systematically gathering and applying evidence in real time to guide clinical care, how someone is cared for in uh, the hospital or, or practice that they attend. You need to be employing and leveraging IT, which allows you to disseminate uh, learnings to other clinicians and help them improve their decision making. You, uh, you know, a core element is the inclusion of patients uh, that lived experience as members of the learning team that is integral and critical in a learning system. You're capture, uh, capturing and analyzing data. Um, you know, and creating this continual learning loop uh, of assessing outcomes, refining processes, and training um, for a feedback cycle to, to improve learning and, and quality care. And that other piece that you mentioned of quality improvement or QI is the framework by which you systematically improve a process or a system. Uh, it's a methodical approach to evaluate how a system currently runs with the goal of improving the end game. And in QI, you start with your big goal and then you're working backwards to find out what gets you to that goal. And right. at each phase of that journey, there's opportunities to test change and create improvement. So it's not just improving at the, at the you know, big moonshot level. It's all of those small pieces that lead you to that moonshot improvement. Um, and it creates, like I said, a, a really rich environment for, for opportunities to test change. And there's tools and methodologies that allow you to do that. Um, you are looking to adopt something that clearly works 
uh, adapt something that shows promise but still isn't getting you the result that you're looking for and abandoning um, the ways of thing ways of doing something that doesn't work. Um, it's constantly viewing what you're doing, being active. A big key in, in Ellis is starting before you're ready, looking to find those issues and, and try. Um, you want to predict what might work, test. It's, you know, it's really a fearless, uh, you have to be kind of fearless in doing this work. Right. No, th that was really well put. I'm sorry, I was looking to the side. We had um, a a bot um, come in and <laughs> say some oh. pretty um, crude things on our chat. So that oh, is I'm a sorry, part of this. Know. Yes. So I just got rid of that. So I apologize to our community who saw that chat. I've banned um, sarcoid um, from future chat. So apologize for that. Um, thank you for explaining, though, what this all means. I think this is clearly is obviously a big part of what we're trying to do with the Epilepsy Foundation. And if we're going to look ahead to the future, um, you know, to cure epilepsy and epilepsy, what have you, this is such an important piece of it. Um, so how is this learning network different from traditional research? And maybe you can just talk a little bit, too, about like how, you know, the research that we're funding, how that actually can translate into action. Yeah, absolutely. So in Ellis, there are two components, you know, there's quality improvement, and there's a research element as well. In traditional research, um, the time frame is extensive. Traditional research models take years of collecting data, and then, you know, looking back and trying to evaluate what happened, what you might be able to do going forward. But the time frame again for improvement is, is quite long. In QI, you're constantly collecting data and evaluating it so that you can apply learnings and change in real time. Um, work being done in quality improvement has an impact for people uh, now in right. uh, those that are involved in the process. It's not years away. Right, Changes right. In clinics in Ellis are happening now. Uh, and in That's QI, so cool. there's also, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a really unique way of doing things. It's been done in other disease areas. Uh, in neurology, we're a little late to the game, apart from stroke would be the exception. Oh, okay. But this is, yeah, but this is new for epilepsy. And, you know, there's a there's an emphasis on being able to reproduce this and disseminate um, to others so that they can, you know, not re need to recreate the wheel. Um, and in the context of Ellis, this translates into that no matter where someone attends for their epilepsy care, they're going to have the opportunity to receive the most cutting edge, high quality care um, possible, irregardless of where in the country they're lo located. Got it. So is that kind of like the ultimate vision or goal of Ellis and what we're trying to do? Yeah. So Ellis really aligns um, with all of the work that is done uh, at the Epilepsy Foundation and that so many of the viewers today uh, have, have really contributed and helped support. Um, the vision in Ellis is that all people living with epilepsy will be able to live their highest quality of life, striving for freedom from seizures and side effects, and we won't stop until we get there. And I, I want to emphasize all people, because we recognize that in epilepsy, there's a vast landscape of types of seizures, causes of epilepsy and seizures, you know, structural, genetic, uh, traumatic sometimes unknown and you know that's just to name a few and that every journey looks different epilepsy syndromes can be extremely rare um, and some people are more greatly affected by their epilepsy or their seizures than others so in ellis even if seizure freedom isn't the ideal goal or a realistic outcome for someone with epilepsy there are still plenty of outcomes that we can improve right. to make that person's life better Right, right. So, you know, small things that we're able to do because we've had Ellis kind of, I'm curious about when we started Ellis. So I don't know if you yeah. mentioned that earlier or if I missed that, but. No. So it's the time has really flown. Uh, our network came to be in 2018 with an opportunity from the PCORI Institute, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute. Oh, okay. And at that time, EF partnered with the National, Asso National Association of Epilepsy Centers 
they're the accrediting body um, that work with clinical sites that provide epilepsy care. Oh. Um, in addition to groups like our local network, you know, in the, in the regions of the United States, rare epilepsy groups and others to create this framework to build a learning health system in epilepsy. And we were successful in that grant opportunity uh, in 2018. And since then, we've been really building our infrastructure, sustainability, been hard at work and in quality improvement and data collection. And we've now, you know, grown to be a network of 14 adult and pediatric clinical sites, 19 community partners, and just really an incredible group of um, people, groups, and institutions to, to drive this work. Right. Okay. So not even that long. And yeah. we're really partnering with kind of existing framework too, which probably has helped us make great progress. Would you say? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you know, we can talk a little bit today too about the different areas that we're starting with, the priority areas and measures that we're working to improve. We also have a roadmap um, that tells us, you know, what measures down the road do we want to start improving? And at each step of the way, I mentioned earlier, we're involving um, all stakeholder voices. So we want to make sure that we're tying in um, the, the lived experience. Uh, from people living with epilepsy, their families and caregivers, clinicians, researchers, academics, uh, and others in, in setting those goals. And that happens in a process called co-production. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. That's really cool. Um, we had a comment. That sounds amazing. Um, actually, from one of our ambassadors, she um, they have epilepsy. He has epilepsy. Um, thank you for joining. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for joining. Again, I want to apologize if anybody saw that comment earlier. You guys know how it's like on Twitch. You never know what can happen or who could show up in your chat, but that's why we're here. We're here to obviously help raise awareness, make sure that our community has the support. And so we will fight those bots with you. Um, so I want to apologize again for that if you saw that. If not, great, then <laughs> good, out of sight, out of mind. Um, so moving on in our discussion, um, what other groups outside of epilepsy do quality improvement work? And kind of what has their impact been? And I know, I think you kind of alluded to this a little bit before. Yeah, that's a really great question. And um, I mentioned that neurology as a whole has been a little bit late to the quality improvement game uh, than others, maybe with the exception of the stroke groups, um, which have done this really well. But learning networks have been around for about a decade, a little bit more. Um, and particular learning networks have made huge impacts for the people living um, with the conditions that they represent. Uh, areas like pediatric inflammatory bowel disease, kidney oh. or renal diseases, um, adverse events or dangerous events in hospitals, premature births, cardiology. Um, these networks have really improved outcomes for their patients and their communities. And one example that I just love to give because in my view, epilepsy, um, the epilepsy space, the sky is the limit. Um, I'll give right. and I'll tell you why I think that um, based on what the work of one network called Improved Care Now. Um, they are a network focused on pediatric inflammatory bowel disease. Um, historically for years, for decades, since, you know, the beginning of care in that group, um, they had, a, you know, a, a kind of glass ceiling for their patients that only about 50% of people or reaching remission or good control of their inflammatory bowel wow. disease. These are children living with really, you know, a very difficult um, condition. And so they had no new surgical techniques coming forward, no new medications coming to the market available for people. And what they decided to do was um, look back and see where, if they collected data in a standardized way, where were the opportunities for improvement that they were missing? What could they be working with that they already had, but apply it differently? And they formed a learning healthcare system called Improved Care Now. Okay. Um, and over the course of, they've been about 10 years now, from 50% people in reaching remission, they're now hovering around 90%. Um, which really? Is unbelievable. With oh no my gosh. With no is, treatment no treatment. And so it's really learning from the data and changing your care based on the data. It's not wow. um, collecting data just to say, aren't we great? We can create, you know, huge registries, but not be, you know, doing anything with it in real time. 
And so with epilepsy, you know, we have surgical techniques coming, you know, coming to practice, medications coming to market, um, monitoring devices and diagnostic tools that are available to us. And we have such an incredibly motivated um, community, people living with epilepsy, their families and caregivers, the clinicians are really all in. Um, and so the sky is really the limit for epilepsy. We can learn from um, our practices and make sure that we're not missing opportunities to connect the person, you know, a person with the right treatment um, option for them or diagnostic option for them. So it's really an, uh, an exciting precipice to be on yeah. and we're, we're, we're going there. We're doing it. Wow. 90%. 90%. Just from I mean, having a learning network. From, yeah, from that, you know, continuous wow. learning cycle. And the other, you know, big piece of the success there is that um, I believe it's like 60%, maybe even 80% of the clinics around the country that care for people with, you know, children with uh, inflammatory bowel disease participate in that network. Wow. Okay. So, you know, essentially almost anyone who has uh, inflammatory bowel disease as a child most likely they're attending a clinic that participates in that quality improvement work. So that goes back to one thing that I mentioned earlier is that committed group of leaders to change the culture um, of how right. we revamp practice and how we apply what we learn in a time right. frame that matters now. And inf information sharing, how important that is. Wow, that is so cool. That I is like that very promising, right? Um, do you have any stats right now about kind of where we're at and like what, what benchmarks we're going to be using for Ellis? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, one big part of epilepsy is that despite all of the therapies that we have available, you know, we're missing a third of people to, you know, to reach seizure freedom or seizure control. Um, and that has a huge impact on their safety. You know, uncontrolled seizures are associated with higher risks of premature death of serious injury. Um, it causes there to be wide variations in epilepsy care delivery. Um, comorbidities like depression and anxiety are frequently undiagnosed and we're missing treatments that might be potentially curative or work really well for someone. Um, and those can include medications, surgeries, devices, dietary therapies, um, because we're not getting early enough referral to specialty care for people who need it. Right. And in the United States, we spend more uh, and have worse health outcomes than nations comparable to us. And Ellis, you know, we want to change that so that no matter where someone attends for their care, um, we want to be delivering that care at the highest standard right. um, with those changes made in real time. And so we're focusing, I mentioned earlier, we have a roadmap of, you know, early priorities and then ones that we know will come down the road. And one that we're, you know, honing in on early and have been doing work in, um, there's a few, but the first I'll mention is seizure documentation. And this is documentation of what type of seizure seizures people are having and how often they're having them. And documentation happens both, you know, in the clinic by the provider, mm. but also people at home tracking their seizures or their, or their child or loved one's seizures. Right. <laughs> because... If you don't know what kind of seizure someone's experiencing, um, if you don't know how often they're happening and what you know impact that's having in their day to day, it is impossible to make um, the right options available to that person. You don't know how to provide the best care, what treatments might be appropriate, right. what investigations might be needed for that person. So that's a really concrete um, early phase intervention that we can be working on and are working on. Right. The other one I'll mention is barriers to medication adherence. You know, taking medications can be really difficult for some people. Um, there might be things that get in the way of them being able to take their medications. And it's not always what, um, you know, might be thought of, you know, it could be in issues with insurance or affordability of the medications. Those, they are not um, always affordable. It can be remembering some people are on, you know, for, for medications and how are you going to, um, track those if you don't have a way that works for you? 
you could have difficulty swallowing pills or something else. And so if providers can understand, you know, be communicating with their patients effectively and hearing from the person, you know, in that lived experience seat, what's getting in the way of them being able to take the medication as prescribed, you know, there's that strong team now of the person with epilepsy or the family, the clinician, and it it gives you an action avenue um, to help that person and their family address it. Right, right. And then help others with it too, if they're a part of Ellis, right? Absolutely. And quality of life. You know, I mentioned earlier that not all people living with epilepsy might reach seizure freedom, um, particularly in the rare epilepsy uh, diagnoses. Some of those are extremely devastating. Um, And, you know, people have hundreds of seizures a day. And for them, they may not want to achieve zero seizures because that might come at the cost of wakefulness or Mm. alertness or ability to interact with family. You don't want to take that quality of life piece away. Um, And we need to really be prioritizing that. And so the, you know, that linkage between the clinician and the person um, experiencing epilepsy um, can identify something to be improved and work together towards that. And all of the work um, of Ellis and at the Epilepsy Foundation Um, is through a lens of inclusion and equity and diversity um, with attention to social determinants of health. We really want to meet each individual um, where they are and get them the care they need uh, on that personalized basis. Right, right. Wow. Um, I'm sure our chat's like, this is the least Monique has ever talked. I'm very (laughs) interested in this. Um, This is so cool. I really kind of had Obviously, you read things, and I work at the Epilepsy Foundation, so I'm aware yeah. of Ellis. I knew how to pronounce it, yeah. but in terms of the actual actionable items and the pieces of it that really make it and why we're doing it, I really was yeah. not as informed on. So thank you for providing that info. I'm, I'm, I'm still in shock about that other example <laughs> you said. I know. Because that is I just, know. it just shows you how important, like, the information sharing and participation in this yeah. is so important. Um, so speaking of participation, I know you've kind of alluded to this, but who makes up Ellis? So how are we able to gather that, get that information, data sharing going? Yeah. Um, so in Ellis, there's, you know, like I mentioned, there's a diverse group of, of stakeholders, um, people living with epilepsy, the families, uh, and care providers and partners, um, epilepsy healthcare cent- centers and, and the clinical providers, you know, doctors, nurses, academics, and researchers, um, local community service and advocacy organizations. Those can include the local EF offices, um, rare epilepsy groups, other epilepsy organizations, um, working together in this framework of co production. Mm. And co production is where all of those stakeholders are equal and reciprocal contributors to produce information. And the way that I would explain it, because co-production again, is kind of a, a new concept and a new, it, it really requires a culture shift in the way that clinical care is provided. Um, because you really do need to bring those, those you know, different perspectives together. And I would say, if you picture a Venn diagram and in one circle, you have that lived experience, the expertise of what it's like to live with epilepsy or, you know, your loved one and care for someone who has epilepsy. And that perspective can only be brought by the people affected by epilepsy, their families and their care providers. And in Ellis, we call um, that group PFPs, patient family partners. Okay. Um, Because again, we realize that, you know, in your, in your uh, family dynamic, these partners are, are sometimes a parent, sometimes a spouse, um, you know, or others. And so anyone that is involved in that lived experience, we, we call it PFP. And then in the other circle is the disease knowledge piece, you know, perspectives that are brought from the clinic, um, from healthcare professionals. And it's in the middle of that Venn diagram that you get co-production. Mm. And what's generated in this kind of work is multifold right? So there's data that comes out of it. And data is both clinical and patient reported. Um, There's knowledge, insights, informal research that comes out of this. 
And then there's that know-how, that expertise in the clinic um, to improve health and healthcare outcomes that come out of this, you know, marrying together of these different and, and really um, valuing the perspectives at every step of the work. It's right. not um, the other way that it's kind of different from the way things have been done before is that we're not, you know, charging ahead and creating a framework with just the, you know, just the clinicians and then coming to people with epilepsy and saying, here it is, what do you think? This is really involving that perspective from the very, very beginning. So when we send, you know, when we're setting our, you know, our moonshot goal, which is all people living with epilepsy striving for freedom from seizures and side effects, and we won't stop until we get there. That moonshot vision was formed, you know, and really greatly informed by the voice of, of the lived experience, the, um, the patient family partners. Right. Um, and so it's not an afterthought. We really, and that's where that culture shift comes in. It's new for people living with epilepsy to be so involved. It's new for clinicians to be thinking in this way and then working backwards. Like I mentioned, right. along that, you know, once you have your moonshot, well, now what are the pieces that get you there? And there's a role for each person. And so we're weaving those together um, to really change the way things are done. This is, you know, this is really exciting stuff. And it's been done with Ellis just over the last, in the last couple of years. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. Um, so we did have a question in chat. Um, I think this is something we might be discussing in the future, but um, our ambassador had asked, is there a form we can get to help at, ha at home documentation? Yeah. So that's a really great question. And the Epilepsy Foundation has, has been doing, you know, a lot of work in terms of seizure diary um, and seizure tracking. So there are tools available in epilepsy.com that someone can go in and download uh, that they could use to track either on a calendar, some other format. We've seen a really great variety in Ellis of the way that people track their seizures. Some um, people come in with a monthly calendar or a weekly calendar, and they've tracked um, their seizure type and the times that it's happening. A really big part of seizure tracking is also, you know, if someone's aware of a trigger, recording that in line with, with, the, with those events, and being specific if there are um, characteristics of the seizure. That's really important and can really inform um, if the person doesn't know what type of seizures they have. Um, so bringing that to clinics um, is always uh, valuable and recommended. But one thing that we have heard from our PFPs in Ellis is that, um, you know, an important piece is making sure we're, you know, we're making clear to the person or caregiver or, or partner that's bringing this information to the clinic. We need to make clear from the provider perspective the value that that brings. Um, people work really hard at tracking their seizures. It's not, it's not an easy thing to always be doing. You know, right. it takes time. It takes effort. Um, and making making clear that that type of information is valuable to their care uh, is important. And so that was one thing that we've been working on emphasizing to the clinicians, how do we fold in review of something like a seizure diary or a seizure tracker into the clinical visit when it's already quite time limited right. um, and prioritizing if that's something that a person wants to speak with their clinician about, we need to make sure that there's time designated for that. Right. Oh, that's good. Allison's actually here. Hey, Allison. Allison hey. Kukla. Um, she said, I use an app by Niall that makes it easy to track. I just... I used to just use a Word document. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Ash, the individual that asked the question, thanks. I I know different tools ask for different information that I feel some lose um, some critical info that doctors need to know. Mm -hmm. So some that of them, is, yeah. yeah. That is so true. Um, and, you know, recording in a comprehensive way, you know, we I think we have yet to strike the, the perfect recording tool. Right. But that'll be something... With Ellis, we'll, right? We'll come, we'll come out of Ellis. Yeah. We know that we can together work out with the, you know, the lived experience, the clinical experience. What are those key elements that have to be recorded for every seizure? Because why, you know, what is the, what is the real impact and what can we learn? Right. Right. So important. Yes. Seizure tracking. So I, I posted the link to our toolbox, which kind of mentions um, right. what, 
Kathleen was talking about today. So if you guys have more questions, let me know. Obviously, I think, obviously, Ash, you're in our Discord. If you have more questions, too, for Kathleen about that specifically, feel free to DM me and I can connect you guys. Um, so I think just kind of getting back into our, we have an impromptu agenda, guys. I want to make sure we get everything talked about today while we have Kathleen for only another half hour. <laughs> um, time fine. is flying. Um, and so I'm going to go kind of back to it. So I think um, the next kind of question we were going to discuss was um, people with epilepsy and their families, what kind of role they have in Ellis. And I think we kind of talked about that with tracking, right? And mm -hmm. the toolbox. But is there anything else that is important to kind of highlight there? Yeah, I would say, you know, the, the PFP, as I mentioned, is an integral uh, component to the, to the clinical community linkage that Ellis is looking to forge. Um, people living with epilepsy share their experiences, their needs, their hopes, um, where they, you know, feel there, there are challenges. That perspective is what determines priorities for the Learning Health Network. Right. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, you know, it's at a foundational level and carried the full way through. It's not thought of as an afterthought. Um, so what we're seeing in Ellis as, you know, a clinical site comes on board in, in a particular state, we want to make sure that, you know, that clinician team and, you know, of, of, of doctors, of nurses, um, and others are working directly with, you know, a few patient family partners, at least at their, at their site. Um, who provide those perspectives at the work, you know, into the work that's happening at that site. Mm. The other component of an LS team is a local um, community organization or advocacy organization. And, you know, the local Epilepsy Foundation Network has been um, really successful at forging these partnerships where epilepsy groups. And so what we're, what we're finding and what's recommended is that these teams with all of those perspectives are meeting on their own or huddling on their own to discuss upcoming work or work that they have going on. And it's that constant feedback loop, you know, of, of sharing what they're going to be doing when, you know, what might be their next priority is what makes Ellis, you know, is what makes those wheels turn. Um, so there are great opportunities. And you mentioned Allison Kukla joined. Allison is the leader of the community core of the network. And so we have... Yeah, so we have a lot of information um, available on epilepsy.com slash ELHS. Um, we have, you know, kind of background material um, and, a, and a handout that, that patient family partners and community organizations can, can reflect on and reach out uh, if they're interested in learning more or potentially interested in partnering um, on, a, on an existing LS team. We've also had successes where um, a patient family partner or a local community group really were the advocates for a clinical site to come on board Ellis. So, you know, providers listen, yeah. um, some better than others, of course, <laughs> but providers, you know, really are in, are in practice for the right reasons. They want to, you know, make people better. Um, they want to improve lives and improve care. Right. And so, you know, it takes a little bit to get into the culture of quality improvement, but we've, um, as I mentioned, had success in a team coming on board because they said we had such a great, relentless community group really advocating for us to join this work because there's benefit for all, you know, for all perspectives. Right. Um, the providers get to provide more high quality care uh, in their day to day work, which is really what they're what they're looking to do. So win win. That's so that's really cool to hear that, that it's also, you know, we're not just necessarily seeking out these health centers. We're also hearing from our communities. And what did you, you said it was F patient family. Um, what was the patient, term? Yeah. Patient family partners. The patient yeah. family partners are also pushing for these. So yeah. that's really cool. Obviously we know as people that are part of this community, that our community is very active in their care and trying to find more support um, for their care. So that is not a surprise. Um, we, Justin says, great to hear that patients and family voices are being included. Yes, exactly. Um, and that's the cool, I think probably my favorite part about Ellis clearly is that it's informing care mm -hmm. um, because it's so important. Obviously, you know your epilepsy and what you deal with in a day. Um, your family knows that, so you're our best resource. It's kind of no different than a doctor asking for a patient history. Um, they really need to know everything about what you're going through. Mm -hmm. um, 
Okay, so what types of measures um, is Ellis starting to improve? Yeah, so um, the ones that I mentioned before, like documentation of seizure frequency, identifying barriers to medication adherence, uh, and quality of life are our first round priorities okay. um, that we're doing active work in now. We also have um, the beginnings of work in a few other areas to grow in the future. Um, and things like, you know, those areas include issues for women and girls with epilepsy. Mm. You know, the epilepsies and their treatments can impact family planning, pregnancy, oh. uh, and can have connections with the menstrual cycle and things like that. We've had questions so, about that in our uh, Discord about weight, just um, resources about epilepsy and pregnancy. So I like to I, hear that. Yeah. So that's a, you know, that's a big priority area coming down the pike for epilepsy. Um, surgery and video EEG investigations, mental health, uh, seizure clusters, and status epilepticus um, are other areas that we're looking to get to before long. Right. Um, at what point would you move to those second kind of priorities to kind of loop them into all the work that we're doing in Ellis? Yeah, so that's a little bit TBD. You yeah. know, again, all things are, are happening in very near terms. Yep. One thing that we want to do, you know, we've, we've been building up to 14 centers mm -hmm. um, where we're at right now. And okay. we're looking to be um, continuing our recruitment to get more clinical centers, more community organizations and PFPs involved. And the other big piece that we've been working on recently is um, we recently switched our data vendor um, and we've been migrating data registry information to this new vendor that is much more a much more comprehensive tool yep. um, has a lot more streamlining capability for what clinicians are able to do um, pulling from the electronic medical record bringing in patient reported outcome data oh, cool. um, directly from people with the, with epilepsy um, the tool that we were initially using was part of that grant where we got our seed funding to start our network. Oh. And we, you know, we, during our testing period, we just identified that it wasn't the right tool for us. It wouldn't allow us to do um, the work that we want to be doing as a network. So we've been in the thick of that. So that, and plus, you know, in addition to COVID um, has caused us to really want to focus on the first, you know, two to three priority measures with a view to improving, um, to looping in those other improvement areas in the, in the months ahead. as we go. Okay. I love that. I think, and you know, in our community, we've taught, I've talked to you guys about how COVID has really changed the way so many nonprofits are doing business, but it has been a good change. It's been a change that maybe would have taken longer um, because we realize the need to be able to reach our community, no matter where they are, no matter what tools or support or what community that they are a part of. And so there is so much going on at the Epilepsy Foundation. I said this in my, actually my personal Instagram story when I was asking for donations for Stream for Epilepsy about how it's really cool to work for an organization that is not afraid of change and that dives right in. And while we are yeah. always overworked and working crazy hours, it's for the good of the cause and these great things that we're able to do in such a quick Quick period of time and that's why yeah. I love Alice because that's such a good representation of that is that we're taking that data and we're making change right now I love what you said about how you know when people think about research they think okay well that's gonna help somebody else Right. right. It's not going to help necessarily me or my family member or my loved one. But Ellis kind of changes the game with that because it's in real time, like you said. So mm -hmm. um, Ash said it honestly makes me even more proud to be part of such a great foundation. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. We love to have you. Obviously, you are such an important part of this community as somebody with epilepsy yourself. So, yeah, thank you for joining in this chat today. This has been a really good one. Um, top four, Kathleen. Oh, <laughs> We've only had four. <laughs> no, it's seriously been really informative um, so far. Um, so we talked about, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say one thing um, that you mentioned is I think timely when we, you know, when we spoke about COVID um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, our rates of, of telemedicine and virtual care in epilepsy was really um, limited. You know, right. some sites were doing it. Some sites were doing it really well for a long time. And you would think it'd be uh, accessible because a lot of people can't drive or don't may not have somebody to take them to the appointment. Right. And so people were missing that opportunity. 
um, to be able to participate virtually uh, when the, when you know when when it's appropriate for their care. But that was a big piece of work that we did at the time of, of the pandemic outbreak. Ellis really shifted um, to focus on telemedicine to support people as they were switching themselves to see their provider virtually, and the providers um, were really, you know, working just incredibly hard to transition to a new way of practice. Right. Um, and what we found was we Ellis created a tool for people living with epilepsy um, to teach them how to you know best prepare for a virtual visit. That was just an unbelievable success. Um, it was something that was available through epilepsy.com. We shared it through our Alice network. Providers were sending it as part of their pre-visit appointment materials oh, cool. to people living with epilepsy so that people could get the most out of their visits. And so that's just an example of how quick, you know, an impact we can have um, in Ellis and the Epilepsy Foundation overall. Right. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, we no, that's a, that's a great I representation of like actual yeah. action. Obviously, I'm not yeah. aware of all of that. Um, so it's cool to hear the action yeah. of it happening in real time. Um, so I know we kind of talked about where we're looking to grow in the future. Um, could you just talk a little bit more about how many epilepsy centers or hospitals are currently participating in Ellis and what that looks like? Yeah, so we have 14 clinical centers around the country right now, Sweet. and those are pretty. That's just since 2018. Yes, I want to. If you've just joined the chat, I want you to know that's just since 2018 that we've started Ellis. 14 different health centers are already involved in this important data information machine learning, if you will, system that is changing epilepsy care in real time. So go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, thanks for the recap. I hope I hope there's more people joining and yes. we're delighted to, to have everyone on. Um, but yeah, 14 sites, we are pretty evenly split on pediatric sites and adult sites. Oh. And again, that goes back to, you know, we're looking to reach all people. Um, so we're, you know, always seeking new partnerships, new memberships. And our goal is to reach 20 centers by middle of the summer this coming 2022. Okay. And do we, is it looking promising or what yes. kind of all goes into like re getting a center on board? Obviously we heard the story earlier about that, those patients and their families that were advocating to be a part of this network, but what kind of goes into it? Um, it's, you know, it's a real group effort. We have, you know, a structure by which we discuss um, with interest, interested sites, the work of our network, how it fits in with the work that they're doing at their center. Um, both in the pediatric space and adult space. Mm -hmm. um, we work with those sites to go through the membership you know, process, which involves not only the membership paperwork, but also there's a legal and IRB right. element to this. You know, These are important pieces um, of a site being able to safely share data, share information with the network so that we can learn um, and sites can learn from each other. What is IRB? Sorry for those that may not know. Yeah, Institutional Review Board. Um, so IRB is a, is a um, governing uh, oversight of research work. Right. And so I mentioned before that Ellis does both quality improvement and traditional research. Quality improvement doesn't involve protected or personal health information. So information gathered for quality improvement alone um, is not attributable to any individual. So your dates of birth, names, addresses, uh, things like that, social security numbers are right. not associated with that data. This is, you know, quality improvement is really population data um, and is wiped of all of those. Mm -hmm. But traditional research does sometimes involve protected or personal health information. Um, and in Ellis, that data is, you know, extremely tightly governed by standards like HIPAA um, right. and high tech, you know, all of these different um, oversights that ensure um, safety of the data and to make sure that nothing is disclosed that shouldn't be. Wow. It's so complicated. Work, it's complicated. <laughs> yeah. It's, you know, it's just incredible. The number of sites that have come on so far, we're in discussions with, uh, multiple other sites. So oh, great. we asked whether we're on target Yeah, and I believe that we are. Oh, great. So, yeah. So we're looking forward to going and it's, you know, it's a commitment from the sites. Um, but they are, you know, what we've seen is they're really eager to, to get into this work and be working effectively with their community partners and PFPs. And I'm sure like hearing all 
of the actionable items that have already come out of it can't, I mean, that's got to be also incentive for their patients and families. Like they want to help, obviously, like we mentioned earlier, doctors, they gen- they want to help their patients. Yeah. Um, they want to be able to improve their life. So clearly this yeah. is a good option for that. Um, yeah. So we obviously talked about how it includes children and adults and kind of um, the data collection piece. So um, if your doctor is at an Ellis hospital, what does that mean for somebody and their loved one? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. For someone who has um, a doctor or their, their, their hospital participates in Ellis, um, we expect that that person will be getting the benefit of everything um, their site is learning from other counterpart members, you okay. know, member sites in Ellis. Um, we do this by studying information and data collected um, for quality improvement and research purposes. And the information that's collected can then be used to inform diagnostic decisions, treatment decisions, um, do comparative effectiveness effectiveness work, um, looking to see what medication or surgical technique works for which you know people. Um, and there's a real strong um, role for that person to then be engaged in the clinical site team along their clinical along with their clinical provider, um, a local advocacy or or um, community service organization. So it's, you know, it's a realistic goal that people could be receiving benefit uh, in their clinical care if their site is participating in Ellis and then getting that opportunity to provide their perspective in all the work that gets done. Right, right. So not only benefiting, but in- influencing yeah. um, what's kind of going on in Ellis. That's cool. And that kind of alludes to what um, Ash said in the chat. Um, it's good to know that my wife's voice does get heard. Um, which is so true with Ellis, clearly. Um, I'm so excited about this. This is so cool. Um, So in terms of kind of, oh, so Ash also said, that's amazing to know that various hospitals can share that info with each other and the foundation to find the best care possible. Yes, absolutely. Um, So true, so true. Um, So where can people learn more or become a part of Ellis? Kind of what are the the kind of actionable items that people could take away from this? Yeah, so I would say visit epilepsy.com forward slash ELHS. We have a lot of good information there. The epilepsy.com site is itself going under a major overhaul and improvement. And so the pages at the moment we know are a little difficult to navigate. There's a lot of content. So we're expecting that those will be improved over the coming months. Yes. So you can learn, you know, and get some introductory materials through epilepsy.com slash Ellis. I'm really hoping that, um, you know, we'll have more opportunities to do this type of, you know, this streaming for epilepsy and share the information because I realize, you know, and, and this is not just for the community, even for the clinical providers, anyone we talk to, it makes sense to hear it over and over yes. again. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a big concept. And so, you know, these opportunities are, are great for, uh, you know, for, for us to get the word out of what's happening, right. to be able to answer your questions. Um, But I would say our website is the right spot. And Monique, if it makes sense, I have some materials I can send you. Yes, please. um, That could be tagged along with this. um, I would love that. Yeah. I think what I can also do is um, I can put it in our Discord for anybody that may have missed this. um, Because I think this could be beneficial to a lot of our community to know. Because do you think if somebody is a part of an Ellis system, whether they're a doctor, do you think they would know that, that their doctor would share that? Or could they be a part of an LS system and not know? Oh, that's a really good question. So what we're, you know, what we're hoping to do in Ellis is that we are, as I mentioned, changing the way care is done. Mm-hmm. And I, I alluded to earlier in that one network for pediatric inflammatory bowel disease, a vast majority of the sites are participating because it is the right thing to do. Right. Um, it enables them to participate and provide the best care for their patients. Mm -hmm. So that is a big culture shift that we're working towards in, in epilepsy, that it'll be sites, you know, all sites will want to participate because of the outcomes they can impact um, and the opportunity to work with people living with epilepsy and their care partners. So um, at the moment, and it's available, I believe our up-to-date map, we've had a few new sites come on board. So I'll make sure I send that to you too, our up-to-date map of where our current sites are. Um, which also shows where our community partners currently are. Yes. Um, but 
right now we have 14. And so I guess some people could be actually attending one of those sites and, and not know. necessarily know. So we'd love um, to see more people being able to have that information, you know, realize how their care is informed. Right. Um, right. And again, grow the network to include, again, a vast majority of epilepsy centers. I mentioned one of our partners is the National Association of Epilepsy Centers. And, you know, they have, a you know, a, a, um, a great role in terms of saying what's valuable in care. Um, and so we're hoping in the future to be building Ellis into um, the way that sites, you know, come to be. A key piece of care. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we actually had somebody ask, am I able to help convince my provider to participate in Ellis? Yes, you absolutely are. And so um, I'm not sure if you just joined, but that, you know, we've had, we've seen success in Ellis from people right. living with epilepsy and community partners, uh, whether it's a local EF office or rare epilepsy group um, or someone else. Influence. We've actually had at least one or two sites come on board because that, that community uh, voice was so strong to say, we got to participate. How can I help? Um, and so in those instances, support. do you know kind of what steps those, those organ, obviously we tried to influence it, but more from the patient side and the family side, um, how they were able to kind of affect that change and to get their um, physician involved? Yeah, I think it varies depending on the site and depending on the location. But one thing that we are looking to do is make sure that sites that are considering participating in Ellis have that um, buy-in at their institutional level. Mm -hmm. An individual provider does not an Ellis site make, yes. right? And so we have these incredibly motivated site champions, and that is needed, right? right. Like that, you need you need a provider that really believes in the work, but you also need that institutional buy-in. And so on the Ellis core leadership team, we work with those sites to say, come and present at grand rounds or mm. schedule one-on-one -on -one time with um, their executive level uh, leaders, the providers um, and present to them. So if, right. you know, if it's that dual approach, I think it's the, you know, just all the stronger. I love the idea of grand rounds. Um, my, we were talking before we went live, guys. You all know because he's been on here before. If you're a frequent streamer, my boyfriend is a physician, and he attends grand rounds once a week. Yes. It's a Zoom call now, um, and they have speakers come from everywhere to talk about different topics. So I love that idea because I obviously could see that happening. It happens yes. with my partner all the time. Um, with new treatments that they bring to the table or outcomes. So, um, Justin, so basically it sounds like sharing this information with your provider is a great first step. Um, we can, you can also contact people from the, our website, from our Ellis, like Kathleen, um, and they can also provide more information to your provider and the health system um, to help get your provider and obviously like she said, a, how did you say it? It was perfectly said, a provider does a, uh, Help me. <laughs> one provider yes. does not an Ellis does site not an make. Ellis site make. Yes, one provider does not an Ellis site make. However, that they can be the, the right champion direction. to get it to be a part of Ellis. So obviously, yeah. they need the internal buy-in. So hopefully, that helped answer your question. Um, do we have any other questions in the chat? I, this is a great time to kind of pause before we wrap things up. If there's anything else you need to know. Oh, Allison said you need to write that quote down <laughs> and use that uh, for future pitches. <laughs> I love that. Um, if there's any other questions, let us know. If you are not a part of our Discord, I highly encourage you to join. Um, Discord is where we chat about all things epilepsy related. Our community exists really strongly there. Okay, good, Justin. Good, good, good. Um, and I will be providing more information about this talk in there. Um, we do upload our videos to YouTube. I'm going to try to get that really horrible comment out of it before I upload because um, that was not kind. And um, yes, Ash, you're welcome. She's, Ash, he said, just wanted to say thank you so much for all of your hard work and dedication. Thank that is you. to you. Yes. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kathleen. It's, you know, it's really the work that I get to do with the Epilepsy Foundation. Um, I just consider myself the luckiest person ever because I get to work with people living 
uh, with epilepsy, the people who love them and, and who they love, um, the providers, the researchers, the academics, you know, it, it's, it's that whole, you know, perspective, that married right. perspective and that, um, that spectrum that is just incredible. And really, I think leverages everyone's talents, everyone, everyone brings to the table. Um, and like I said earlier, the sky is the limit for epilepsy. I really believe that right. um, we're seeing it all, you know, we're seeing it already in the growth of our network. Um, so thank you. Yeah. For being thank involved you. In, in work like this. Yes, I couldn't agree more. Um, we really appreciate and value all the work that's being done. And thank you for coming here to share it with our community. Did you have any final thoughts or items to kind of wrap up with our community? Um, I would say that, uh, you know, we're coming into November for National uh, Epilepsy Awareness Month. And just um, it's an opportunity to recognize the people who are, are living with epilepsy, all the work that's being done to improve the lives um, of people living with epilepsy and that Ellis tie-in that we're looking to improve care uh, for every person. So I would just say thank you. And I hope to reconnect with this group again soon to give an update. Yes, um, I would love to have you on again yeah. if you weren't too scared away by today. Um, I could not I have nervous. put it better. I know you were, but you did great. <laughs> um, honestly, I could not have put it better myself. Kathleen really nailed it, you guys. Um, truly, you know, November is a month where we celebrate you. We celebrate the victories that we've had in epilepsy, but we also acknowledge the work that we have left to go and how we can do it with our community's help and buy-in. Buy Ash just said, now I'm fired up to stream for Neem. So Kathleen, I'm not sure if you know this, November is also our big month for stream for epilepsy. It's called Game Over Epilepsy. We have over 30 creators planning to charity stream throughout the entire month. Oh, wow. Um, we also have different mission topics. We're going to be talking with Laquisa. We're going to be talking with Dr. French. It's our second time on here. And we're also going to be talking with Kate Brocker um, and then Laura Widener revisiting after my technical issues. So we have a lot planned in November. Our goal is to raise $50,000 to support our programs and services and what we do. So Ash is a big part of that as an ambassador. So, yes, I am fired up, too. This was like a perfect way to really kind of kickstart what we're going to be doing in November. Obviously, all year round, we are still working, but it's great to be able to kind of have that touch point in November and yeah. kind of remind ourselves of why we're here and hear the stories from our community and the ways that we've been able to impact care through things like Ellis. Ellis is such an important piece of that and it's such a short period of time, too. Um, that's so, I can't, I can't, I still am in shock by some of the stats. I'm going to have to like highlight some in our discord and remember, remind myself of that quote. Um, I'm going to have to write <laughs> that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, but everybody, please join me in thanking Kathleen. Um, we really appreciate your participation. I know, you know, Obviously, it's a Thursday. Everybody has life going on, but we really appreciate you tuning in for everything that we do for Stream for Epilepsy. If you have any questions, as always, you can DM me in the Discord. It's Momonique is my name. Um, you also can email us at stream at efa.org, and I can help connect you with the incredible staff like Kathleen and experts on epilepsy at any given point in time. Obviously, I am not the expert and I am not a doctor. That is a disclaimer. Um, so, of course, the, your, your care options are best expressed with your provider or healthcare. But hopefully you are now armed with more information so you're able to go in there and help get your provider a part of Ellis so you can be a part of this information sharing and data collection that can really change care today for people just like you, not 20 years down the line um, with different research efforts. So thank you again, Kathleen. You did thank a great you. job. Um, really appreciate all you do. And guys, we will be back um, on November 1st, uh, where we're going to be kicking off everything for November. So join in at 8 p.m. Eastern. Um, I am going to be doing a kickoff co-hosting with some of our great ambassadors. Um, we're going to be sharing some people's stories about why they stream for epilepsy. I, we're going to play some Among Us. Just kind of have a good time for a Monday night. Um, I'm planning on staying up late. I already told my boss I might be signing in a little bit later on Tuesday morning. Um, so I'm going to be hanging out with you guys and kicking off everything that we're doing for November. I also encourage all of you to check out streamforepilepsy.com. We have our full schedule of streams. Kathleen, we have over 60 streams 
and 30 creators um, for November so far. So su awesome. super excited. I wish we had an automated system to update the schedule, but alas, that is where we're at with our technology until I'm able to update it. Um, but again, thank you guys. And we appreciate you. We love you. And we look forward to seeing you again on November 1st. And thanks again to Kathleen. Take care, everyone. Bye, everybody.